Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of Diverse Voices, Intersectionality, and the Health of Women. I will begin with a few key logistics. Today's meeting is being recorded. All registrants will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording and information about subsequent sessions. We have live captioning and ASL interpreters today. If you need captioning, please click on the closed caption button in the Zoom menu bar at the bottom to enable captions. Participants will be muted throughout today's event. If you have questions during the session, please submit them using the cat the, sh the chat function. Feel free also to indicate to which presenter you would like your question directed. The Diverse Voices Speaker Series disseminates research findings that are relevant to diverse groups of women, and it incorporates a multidimensional sex and gender focus. Today's session is titled COVID-19 and Women. We are pleased to provide a forum to discuss the opportunities and challenges in engaging women in COVID-19 research. Thank you again for joining us today, and I now introduce Dr. Sarah Timken, the Associate Director for Clinical Research within the NIH, within the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, ORWH. Dr. Timken. Thank you so much for opening this uh, webinar, Dr. Whitaker. Um, and I'm happy to be here as the Associate Director for the Clinical Research um, Section in the Office of Research on Women's Health. The last two and a half years have really underscored the critical importance of bringing an intersectional sex and gender aware lens to public health research. During COVID, sex differences in innate immunity have contributed to an increase in male, um, in male COVID deaths. Overall, more men, men than women have died of COVID. However, gender as a social and cultural variable has emerged as an equally important consideration. Data from the COVID pandemic and other health emergencies indicate that women experience significant mental health and economic effects that result from unpaid or underpaid roles as caregivers and have an increased risk of intimate partner violence and gender-based violence during quarantines and throughout crises. Women have faced decreased autonomy over their sexual, reproductive, and other health needs during this public health emergency. And concurrently, we have witnessed increased rates of maternal and neonatal mortality. Both sex and gender are influenced by other social variables, such as race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Intersectionality is a framework for understanding how socially determined identity categories like race and gender overlap and intersect to and interact to create and maintain health disparities. The term coined in 1989 by feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw has been widely taken up across disciplines to explain racialized and gendered health disparities. In the context of the COVID pandemic, we have seen that although males as a group have had my higher mortality than females, race disaggregated mortality has provided a different perspective. Dr. Shattuck Heidern will tell us about her work in this space, which has shown that Black women have, co have had COVID mortality rates almost four times higher than that of white men and three times higher than that of Asian men. Understanding the extremely high death rates um, of Black men and women requires consideration of how social factors interact with gender and race to shape disparities. Addressing these disparities requires a robust, intentional research agenda that incorporates sex, gender, race, ethnicity, social, socioeconomic status, and other social determinants of health from the start of the research project development. Efforts like the NIH Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostic Underserved Populations, or RADx up were developed to understand the factors associated with disparities in COVID-19 morbidity and mortality, and to lay a foundation to reduce disparities for those underserved and vulnerable populations who are disproportionately affected by, have the highest infection rates of, and or are most at risk for complications or poor outcomes from the, from the COVID, uh, during the COVID pandemic. Dr. Wallace will tell us about his work leading to efforts, leading efforts to engage diverse populations with COVID vaccine research via the NIAD supported COVID-19 prevention network. And we're so glad that you can all join us today for this session. I'm going to hand, uh, hand the webinar back to Dr. Whitaker 
um, who will introduce our speakers today. Thank you, Dr. Timken. I am now going to introduce Dr. Heather Shattuck Heidorn. She is a scholar working at the intersection of public health, gender theory, and human biology. She is an assistant professor of women and gender studies at the University of Southern Maine and a co founder and assistant director of the Harvard Gender Sci Lab. She uses feminist theory to motivate hypothesis based research, examining how social lives become embedded, reflected in our hormones, immune function, and other biology. Current projects include investigations of how gender, from an intersectional perspective, relates to stress and immune function, critical STS work on the operationalization and theorization of gender and sex in the biomedical sciences, and ongoing project work examining gender and sex inequities in COVID-19 outcomes. Uh, next, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Stefan E. Wallace, who is a research epidemiologist, public health and business consultant, and a public health and social justice leader. He has more than two decades of experience in public health and human services, including HIV, AIDS, and other infectious diseases, and in social justice efforts, and more than a decade experience conducting public health research globally. He is the director of the external relations for the Fred Hutch-based COVID-19 Prevention Network, or COVPN, and HIV Vaccine Trials Network, HVTN, a staff scientist in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division at Fred Hutch, a clinical assistant professor in global health at the University of Washington, and the director of the Office of Community Engagement in the UW Fred Hutch Center for AIDS Research. Dr. Wallace, a U.S. Army veteran, has earned a master's degrees in management and organizational leadership and a PhD in public health epidemiology. Dr. Wallace holds membership in and serves on the board of numerous regional, national, and international organizations. We will now transition into our panelist presentations, after which Dr. Shilpa Amin will mod moderate the Q&A session. Dr. Janine Austin Clayton, the director of ORWH, will close the meeting. Dr. Shadik Hedren. Thank you. Um, and let's see, I'm going to do the screen share. And here I have to. Okay, you guys should be just seeing the slides, right? Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so first, I would like to thank the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health for organizing this event and for inviting me. Um, it's, re it's truly an honor. My name is Heather shattuck Hydorn, and uh, as Doc, uh, Maya Whitaker said, I'm a co-founder and assistant director of the Harvard Gender Sci Lab uh, and a professor of women and gender studies at the University of Southern Maine. While I'm in a gender studies program now, my training is as a human biologist, uh, and I have extensive experience in traditional scientific disciplines. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about my experience of bringing the lens of intersectionality into a scientific research program. So before we get too far into this, I'd like to make sure that we're all on the same page regarding intersectionality, just in case there's folks here that maybe haven't uh, encountered it much before. So intersectionality is a critical analytical lens developed within Black feminist theory through the foundational work of scholars like Patricia Hill Collins and Kimberly Crenshaw, though drawing on an extensive and deep history of analyses within the writings of Black women, feminist, uh, Black feminist scholars, and women of color scholars in the U.S. A key tenet of intersectionality is a commitment to the analysis of how power dynamics linked to social categories uh, differently structure experiences such that, say, the experience of being Black and being a woman in a racist and sexist society is not simply the additive experience of being Black plus being a woman, but is qualitatively distinct and has different outcomes. For example, a classic example offered by Crenshaw is that of Black women bringing a lawsuit against an industrial employer. The women claimed they had experienced discrimination based on their race and sex. In the case, when the judge examined the employer's hiring practices, it was found that the employer hired both Black people and women, and so there was no finding of discrimination. However, in fact, the employer hired Black men to work on the plant floor and white women to work in the front offices. Because only men worked on the floor and only white people worked in the front offices, there was no space for Black women. A single issue lens that viewed discrimination as present either based on an axis of race or an axis of gender failed to understand the positioning of black women in this case. Crenshaw used the metaphor of an intersection to describe this. In an intersection, people are not necessarily able to be understood as being on either road, they're somewhere different. 
Race and gender are not the only social categories that an intersectional lens can be applied to. Sexuality, gender identity, disability, class, and others are all possible factors that can be considered when seeking to understand how experiences vary among individuals. Uh, there is a rich intellectual history and engagement with intersectionality from a wide variety of disciplines. Um, and I will just refer people interested to these texts and there's many others as good starting points. So now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the lab uh, because it's important to set the stage for this discussion. Formed in 2018, our lab is primarily focused on understanding how gender sex is modeled in the biosciences from both a theoretical and a methodological perspective. Our lab is interdisciplinary. We have historians of science, epidemiologists, philosophers, biologists, and others working side by side to understand the conceptualization and operationalization of gender and sex in diverse, diverse domains, from issues of contemporary sperm quality to evolutionary hypotheses considering innate and gendered preferences. Often our lab works to contest the assumption in the biosciences that biological outcomes that differ between men and women with examples including stress hormones, aspects of immune function and disease states must be primarily mediated by sex linked pathways such as those related to gonadal hormones, 23rd chromosomes or other aspects of innate sex. We also document how differences between sexes assumed to be related to sex itself such as Alzheimer's prevalence or drug metabolism may be better accounted for by other variables, such as age or body weight. We argue that gender as a multi-level intersectional variable is generally under-considered in the biosciences, yet has pervasive effects on human biology. In the spring of 2020, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, our lab members were thrown into the virtual environment. Many of us found ourselves grappling frantically with a lack of childcare or suddenly switching to teaching or learning online. We were all, like everyone else, hyper-focused on the pandemic. As demographic data on cases and deaths began to emerge, it became clear that in many places, more men than women were dying of COVID-19. We watched as in the new domain of COVID mortality, a familiar story began to take shape. Reports of sex disparities were often accompanied by causal claims that attributed them exclusively to innate sex differences. Estrogens, androgens, the Y chromosome, and deep evolutionary differences between men and women were all considered to explain the sex disparity and mortality rates. We are struck by a lack of engagement with evidence for pre-existing and widespread gender-linked health differences between and among the categories of men and women that could influence COVID mortality rates. Here, before we go further, I'd like to just take a, a moment to offer a quick note on the use of language like men and women. In COVID and indeed much of human biology and biomedical research, these categories are used in data collection without clarity as to whether they refer to reported sex assigned at birth, gender identity, or third-party assumptions. In my own work and in our work at the Gender Study Lab, we've questioned the utility of these categories, both for understanding the variation present within human biology, but also for being able to understand biological outcomes associated with gender diversity. In the current work, however, we're largely limited to understanding COVID cases and mortality as they're recorded in state and national level data. So we use the categories as they are used in those data sets with a recognition of and a challenge to their limitations. So early on in the pandemic, this is a piece that um, we wrote in, uh, in the Times, uh, we published some pieces aimed at giving light to contextual factors important to understanding the apparent increased mortality among men. We noted that this was also seen in other coronavirus pandemics, but was later understood to be nearly completely accounted for by comorbidities, age and sex differences and occupational exposure. Other work published at a similarly early time also challenged the idea that innate sex lay behind men's mortality. Researchers examining all COVID deaths in Massachusetts found that the sex difference in COVID deaths was not different than what was expected, given the pre-existing tendency for men to have greater mortality, largely due to differences in chronic conditions. To better understand the COVID-19 claims and data, we began tracking COVID-19 case and mortality rates by sex in the United States, manually collecting and updating the data weekly from state level public health websites. This is all very early in, in the pandemic. Our data set became the first and most comprehensive sex disaggregated breakdown of COVID-19 cases and mortality by state in the US. We made these data publicly available and contextualized by offering charts and figures examining the findings in relation to population size and age structure. Even in the early days of the pandemic, it was clear that the apparent sex difference was far from straightforward. While males were definitely more likely to die than females of COVID, the male to female mortality rate ratio varied widely across states and over time. 
For example, in New York, the initial wave of the pandemic had startlingly high mortality rate among men, yet nearby Connecticut had nearly equal male and female mortality. And in New York, the high mortality of men quickly dropped. And from May 2020 onwards, as the pandemic moved towards more rural areas of the state, our tracker demonstrated that the sex disparity in New York greatly decreased in magnitude. As the pandemic wore on, it also became clear that there were severe disparities across racialized groups in the US that replicated pre-existing health disparities. Compared to white Americans, COVID-19 mortality rates could be close to four times higher among non-Hispanic Black Americans and up to three times higher among Hispanic or Latino Americans. Data and theoretical pieces laid out how these racial disparities were not due to innate biological susceptibility, but rather represented the effects of racism at the interpersonal, institutional, and structural levels. For instance, COVID-19 outcomes were patterned by social and structural factors, including racialized and economic segregation, crowded housing, and neighborhood poverty level. However, no reports examined how mortality varied by race within by sex within race, or how the apparent sex difference in mortality varied across race. Whoops, sorry guys. Motivated by the importance of further understanding the clear racial disparities and the apparent sex disparity, in the summer of 2020, we collected all available US state level data that would allow us to conduct a sex by race analysis. We hypothesized that if there's a strong sex driven biological contributor to the apparent sex disparity, there should be relatively similar sex differences across the social groups. Conversely, if the reason for the sex difference is largely due to social factors, we would expect to see variation in the sex difference between social groups. Based on the results of previously cited analyses, we expected that Black Americans would have higher COVID-19 mortality than white Americans, but we did not know what analyzing race by sex mortality rates would reveal. Our results were stark. Um, and just a quick note, the data range here says March 2020 to September 2021. Um, and that's because originally we ran this analysis in the summer of 2020. And then as I'll talk about in a second, we had a hard time getting the paper published. And so every time we resubmitted, we would rerun the analyses. Um, so eventually uh, it included this data range, the results never changed. Uh, our results were stark. We found that black men had much higher mortality rates than any other race or sex group, revealing a particularly vulnerable subgroup. So here, I think you guys can see my cursor. Um, this is black men in Michigan and here's black men in Georgia. But contrary to the common story of men as uniquely vulnerable, black women had three to four times the mortality rate of white men or Asian Pacific Islander men. So here's Michigan, this is black women's mortality rate and here's white men and here's Asian Pacific Islander men. And then the same for Georgia. We also found that the sex disparity in mortality varied widely between racial groups. So the mortality difference between black men and black women, so the sex difference among black Americans uh, was much larger than the corresponding um, disparity among white men and white women or among Asian Pacific Islander men and women. Additionally, our analysis revealed significant racial disparities within sex. So the difference um, in mortality between black women and white women could be nearly four times greater than the sex difference between white men and white women. For us, the magnitude of the variation in the sex disparity between racialized groups, as well as the fact that black women had much higher mortality than white or Asian men, gave evidence that while there might be some link to innate sex operating in the disparity, social and contextual factors were likely driving the mortality differences. So the point of this talk is also um, is talking about doing intersectionality within the STEM fields. So here, and I'll return to this point later, it's going to be important to note that for, for us, um, the statistical interactions between the categories here is not what makes this piece an example of intersectionality in practice. Our consideration of interacting categories of race and sex does demonstrate how univariate analysis can mask important variation as we uncovered patterns that were not visible considering either race or sex on their own. However, multivariate analysis alone is unable to address or answer complex questions about the ways that intersecting systems of oppression produce COVID-19 mortality disparities. These are just a few of the social factors associated with gender and race that have patterned, how both, ex that have patterned both exposure and susceptibility to the coronavirus. 
We know that black men and women, along with Latino men and women, though our data could not investigate this, are overrepresented in industries like transportation, service workers, and healthcare workers, often industries that were considered essential workers and could not work from home and had higher exposure risks to COVID-19. This and other examples like this, such as neighborhood segregation and housing density, are one, influenced by historical and contemporary racism and discrimination in employment industries and other industries, and two, affect the risk of exposure to COVID-19 during the pandemic. Other factors affected people's susceptibility to COVID given an exposure. For instance, chronic diseases are a well-established risk factor for poor COVID-19 outcomes. Chronic disease patterns in the U.S. often mirror the patterning of data that we saw for COVID-19 outcomes, particularly in Georgia. Chronic diseases are obviously multifactorial in terms of causes, but there's clear linkages between healthcare access, discrimination and racism in the medical care industry, and societal factors affecting the ability to exercise and eat healthy foods, such as poverty or neighborhood factors. There's an increasingly rich literature examining how STEM and other primarily quantitative fields can best apply intersectional approaches. This work demonstrates, and here I have like some of the, um, some of the original uh, people publishing within this uh, literature, like Lisa Boleg um, and Mad uh, Medina Aganor, uh, who published a pretty recent article on quantitative population health. Uh, research, um, as well as folks like Greta Bauer, who have explored like statistical approaches of how you can incorporate intersectionality into um, the STEM fields. So overall, this work demonstrates that there are a variety of statistical techniques that work quite well to illuminate how categories can have different interactional meanings for particular groups. However, such quantitative approaches to intersectionality must be embedded within an epistemological stance committed to contextualizing the data within broader societal structures of power and inequality. And this isn't, to be clear, like my, my own personal position. This is the, the repeatedly um, folks that are writing within this literature. Um, it's what they're uh, hammering home. Given such epistemological commitments, intersectionality can motivate intra and intercategorical analysis in the biomedical sciences that uncovers previously hidden disparities. However, it must be pointed out that the biomedical sciences are usually not well placed to analytically consider societal oppression and power dynamics and have had a reluctance to do so or have even actively dismissed scholarly work from fields that are skilled in these analyses. In our COVID-19 mortality analysis, by anchoring a relatively straightforward conventional epidemiological analysis in Black feminist theory and intersectionality, we created a work product that was contrary to the general organization of the academy and disciplinary publishing silos. Despite the fact that the paper offered well-grounded, original, and crystal clear data analysis for understanding mortality disparities in the pandemic, we ran into significant obstacles publishing the work. Our paper was ready for publication in July 2020 in the critical early days of the pandemic. This information was wanted. While publishing it, we worked on an extensive piece with ProPublica on the death rates among Black men. Post-publication, our work was cited across major press outlets and received widespread attention. It's probably the reason I was invited here today. Yet we were desk rejected from six medical and public health journals before finding a home at the Journal of General Internal Medicine. It's impossible to know why our paper was desk rejected, and we recognize that many teams have trouble publishing at this time and just in general. However, we believe that it's possible that our explicit framing of our analysis and Black feminist theory and intersectionality, as well as our explicit discussion of racism and structural inequalities and inequities was at the root, at least for some journals. We note that three of the six journals were JAMA journals. In early 2021, the universe of JAMA journals came under fire for inadequate consideration of racism by the editors for, among other things, requesting authors to replace references to racism with quote unquote bias and considering pieces focused on racism and health as opinion pieces. When we formed the Gender Sci Lab in 2018, our aim was to challenge traditional knowledge production modes in the academy, particularly in the sciences. These traditional modes grant greater epistemic authority to certain bodies of knowledge, for instance, disciplinary STEM fields, and can insist on disciplinary purity. In contrast, our lab draws together scholars across disciplines who are trained in diverse methodologies. 
our experience working in this way has only deepened and affirmed our understanding that one must move beyond the limits of traditional disciplinary modes to understand how social categories such as gender, race, sexuality, or gender identity influence human health and biology. When looking to apply the framework of intersectionality, scientists will need to onboard people with deep understanding of critical social theory and develop respect and valuing of these other knowledges, including the knowledges of communities uh, themselves and participant communities. Um, at the GenderSci lab, uh, our entire lab is um, composed of racial, gender, and sexual minorities. Um, and we draw from some of these knowledges in how we form our research. Uh, however, I think our primary strength um, is the breadth of disciplinary frameworks that we bring. Feminist geneticist and science studies scholar Banu Subramaniam in her wonderful book, Ghost Stories for Darwin, uh, inspired me to consider inter interdisciplinarity partly as a branching tree with insights possible from different areas. For us, the way we practice intersectionality is based on the notion that for STEM fields in particular, producing knowledge requires synthesizing partial situated knowledges across disciplines and identities. Here, we have emphasized this critical link between interdisciplinary process and intersectionality, what we would call intersectionality as live theory and practice. Within the sciences, there are increasing calls for incorporating intersectionality as a theoretical framework in the development of research questions and methodological approaches. When we consider our own recent research experiences, the primary question that arises is not whether quantitative fields can effectively incorporate intersectionality methodologically. Rather, it is whether these disciplines are prepared to expand their definitions of ways of knowing so as to create space for intersectional analysis in the STEM fields. We have learned that this active consideration of societal power dynamics is likely much harder to incorporate into the STEM fields than the simple inclusion and analysis of diverse and intersecting identity categories. Indeed, we have found um, not just in this COVID work, but in other work, uh, the greatest resistance to our work is in the areas where we cross disciplinary boundaries and incorporate feminist and anti-racist theory into framing and contextualizing quantitative analyses. We find that the STEM fields, uh, off, despite claims to the contrary at times, often continue to see themselves as inherently, even mandatorily apolitical, despite decades of scholarship establishing that science is socially situated and deeply inflected with political uh, values at multiple levels. Intersectional analyses within the biomedical sciences will require a broad range of dis disciplinary frameworks, tools, and methodologies. Without this, due to strict disciplinarity and a vision of scientific objectivity as value neutrality, STEM fields risk co-opting intersectionality and reducing it to a neoliberal politics of diversity that is unmoored from greater questions of social justice uh, and structural power dynamics. And for more on that, I would refer you to um, articles by Selma Blige. Uh, and that is the end of my presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shadik Hadorn. Dr. Wallace? Mike, the virtual mic is now yours. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to uh, my colleague for that really insightful presentation. I am going to talk a bit about the work that we have done in the COVID-19 Prevention Network to uh, engage communities. Um, <clears throat> and this is a snapshot of the presentation to describe these efforts. Um, we have a uh, community and stakeholder engagement strategic plan. Um, and the link to that I have on the last slide and can share. Um, it's also on the preventcovid.org website. Um, and I'm also happy to uh, share these slides uh, with anyone as well. So um, the COVID-19 Prevention Network, of course, was organized uh, by Dr. Fauci and NIAD uh, and really with the goal of responding to the COVID-19 prevention, I'm sorry, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the organization of this new network was uh, conducted by pulling together four established networks that have uh, significant history, experience, and background 
in lots of different interrelated disciplines, including uh, statistical design of studies and analysis, laboratory <clears throat> operations, community engagement, uh, clinical trial management, et cetera. So these are the four networks here that represent the COVPN, uh, the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, the Infectious Disease Clinical Research Consortium, and last but certainly not least, the AIDS Clinical Trial Group. So um, just to contextualize, when we talk about community engagement <clears throat> um, and uh, external relations within the context of the HVTN specifically, um, community engagement is, is, is often thought of as sort of this broader umbrella term, but how we operationalize it uh, is to think sort of local and, and what is the work that's happening around our clinical research sites to engage communities to increase scientific literacy among communities to uh, educate communities to sensitize and prepare communities for participation in clinical research, as well as providing support to our site staff, our CABs, et cetera. And when we talk about external relations, we're talking about the broader community context. We're talking about stakeholders, health associations, um, our policymaker uh, uh, contacts, we're also talking about faith engagement. Um, we're also talking about communications and public relations. So wanted to make that distinction for the purpose of this presentation. What we recognized early on um, was that we were starting to see uh, data that suggests that there were communities that needed to be prioritized in our response. And some of this information, of course, was pre-existing. Um, I think it's been published and, and been stated multiple times that COVID-19 illuminated uh, health disparities and inequities that were already existing for many, community, for many communities and persons. Um, and so what we also recognized was that these communities require nuanced um, strategies to engage them, while also being mindful that broader messages were still very important to ensure that the community as a whole and, and society as a whole was still getting the important information that they needed. So prioritizing communities and populations um, across different race and ethnic groups, as well as occupational uh, groups, as well as older adults. This was really important. Um, and so how we nuanced our approach and our strategies, um, we did so across outreach techniques, we did so across engagement of these communities, both in the local context within our clinical research site uh, activities, but also on the sort of national, international, and broader context as well. Um, relationships uh, with many of these groups were pre-existing for us in the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, um, but we also recognized that we needed to build new relationships to engage new people, uh, to talk to new people, to befriend and, and connect with new people in order to bring them along in the scientific process and ensure that they were informing the work that we were doing and that they also saw themselves in the work as well. So part of this included uh, comprising these expert panels. Um, and my colleague, Dr. Michelle Andrasik, uh, really led this process. And uh, these panels were designed uh, to, to be composed of uh, a number of scientists across different disciplines. Uh, to truly make it interdisciplinary. Um, and these, these expert panels didn't just provide perspective about uh, the trial design process and, and considerations for implementation for the COVID-19 vaccine trials, uh, but they also uh, provided scientific direction uh, for how we need to be thinking about the work that we were doing as well. So these were really important panels that they met, they reviewed informed consent forms, they reviewed the protocols for the studies and provided feedback to them, as well as overall consultation and how we were conducting the science. Um, so these were invaluable uh, to our efforts. So we had um, expert panels across different groups. We had a native and indigenous expert panel, and you can see some of the members here. Um, we had an African American and Black uh, panelist group.
we had a Latinx expert panel group. And of course, we had an older adult and VA expert panel group as well. And what was really important with us uh, as we were thinking about and conceptualizing these expert panels was that we <clears throat> sought out scientists who were not only members of these groups uh, by and large, but that they also had significant experience, uh, research, clinical practice, um, and, and community engagement experience working with uh, these populations as well. So in addition to the expert panel, <clears throat> uh, process, we also convened a community working group. Uh, and the group was also responsible for reviewing informed consent documents for uh, the COVID-19 vaccine studies, as well as the monoclonal antibody studies, um, and were instrumental in helping us think through, strategize, and assist with um, our strategies to even come up with a community and stakeholder engagement strategic plan. Um, so. These folks were instrumental in our process in so many different ways. Many of them are staff at the networks that I described early on. <clears throat> uh, many of them are community leaders and advocates, uh, as well as uh, researchers. So a very diverse group here. As, as well as an internationally diverse group. So we had geographic representation outside the US as well. So part of our efforts were also to uh, build trust. You know, there was a significant amount of uh, um, misinformation being uh, provided to communities in lots of different platforms about COVID-19, about who's at risk or who's susceptible about the vaccine development process in general, the COVID-19 vaccine process more specifically. Um, and so, you know, we're all pretty familiar with the politicization that happened around that time frame. So our work in general represents efforts to build trust and we needed to beef those efforts up significantly in this environment. <clears throat> so we conducted community listening sessions to hear from communities, uh, different kinds of communities about what are their concerns, what are they hearing, what are they thinking, what are they feeling? And these less, these sessions were, again, an opportunity to listen. Um, we held town halls and webinars that were an opportunity to provide information and education to communities, groups, health associations, etc. We met with different groups, uh, including trade unions, uh, folks who worked in different kinds of occupations that might uh, increase their exposure or, or potential exposure to COVID-19 uh, or the virus that causes COVID-19 rather. Um, and it was really important to meet with representatives from these groups as well, because uh, occupational uh, exposure or proximity was uh, certainly a consideration. <clears throat> uh, thinking about the work of grassroots organizations um, and, you know, folks who are doing a lot with, with very little uh, and thinking about those groups who are uh, in the trenches, if you will. Um, and this is just a, a non-exhaustive list, of course. We have over 350 organizations that we were working with, and it would be very difficult to put them all on slides. So, um, you know, working with diverse groups uh, who had different kinds of interests uh, in HIV, outside of HIV, in the social justice uh, air arena on different types of issues from criminalization uh, to uh, incarceration to housing, uh, homelessness, et cetera. We also worked with national organizations, uh, again, not an exhaustive list here, um, the ARP, the National Urban League, UNIDOS US, which is a national civil rights organization focused on the Hispanic and Latin community in the US. Um, we engaged uh, and met with political entities and groups as well, uh, the various caucuses, uh, as well as the Congressional Black Caucus Health uh, Foundation, which um, I had an opportunity to speak to their membership. We launched a faith initiative, um, the HBTN, already had a faith initiative existing prior to COVID. 
Uh, but again, what we saw is that because of the, uh, the environment that we were navigating and that all of us were navigating uh, during COVID, we really needed to increase our efforts here. So we expanded our faith initiative from a one person team to a uh, eight or nine person team uh, that included faith ambassadors working across different geographic regions of the US. Uh, who then reached out to more than 40 or 50 uh, faith leaders uh, in community spaces, working with different faith traditions. Um, we worked with national magazines and media, um, and we also convened scientific panels uh, that were meant to highlight scientists of color, because one of the pieces of feedback that we also received is that a lot of the voices that people were hearing from in media spaces about COVID-19 were white men and so you know the importance of highlighting scientists of color and providing uh, opportunity for people to hear from diverse voices and diverse groups was was something we were intentional about as well so one of our uh program partners uh for this was the black aids institute based out of los angeles uh then uh ceo was ranya copeland um <clears throat> uh, who has since transitioned from the organization and is doing other work um, but our education uh, collaboration with the Black Ace Institute focused on a few different areas, including activating their Black Hollywood Task Force. Um, they have relationships with key um, celebrities, key, key luminaries, um, including Tina Knowles, uh, who is also known as Beyonce's mother. Um, so they were able to organize a webinar to talk with Tina in order to engage her about uh, COVID-19, about HIV, um, and it was a really amazing discussion. Um, they activated their Black Treatment Advocates Network, which is a grassroots network of advocates around the country that are focused on addressing the health in Black communities. Um, so providing education materials um, and information and training uh, to these advocates in order to empower them in their local communities to not only disseminate this information back but also to engage uh, people about um, uh, what, what are their needs around COVID-19, what, uh, what information needs and what service needs do people have that we might be able to also connect to and around. We also work with another group called Treatment Action Group. Um, the executive director there is Mark Harrington um, and some of the same kinds of tactics. Uh, we work with TAG on including webinars, education sessions, um, they conducted a COVID-19 survey that really highlighted um, the, the reality that many people in the community didn't have or didn't feel like they had access to accurate information um, and that they didn't have uh, a sufficient number of trusted voices that they could go to to get information from. Uh, so this was really helpful in helping us to focus our efforts as well as to support um, how we were mobilizing other community partners in the process as well. As I mentioned before, we um, uh, expanded our faith initiative to include additional faith ambassadors who were going to then be working with more faith communities across different faith traditions. Um, and this work would happen um, both virtually and in person. Many uh, faith organizations were still holding in-person services for their congregations and their communities. I've talked to so many uh, faith leaders in the Muslim community and the Sikh community and um, in the Jewish community as well, who were organizing uh, food drives and clothing drives and other things to support people uh, during the pandemic. And they were really hungry for um, information, not only for themselves, but also to share with their, uh, with their parishioners and their congregants and the local community that they were serving. Uh, so this was a, a really amazing initiative um, that I know has also received quite a bit of attention uh, within NIH and NIAD specifically. So these are some of the members of the COVID-19 uh, Prevention Network Faith Initiative, um, again, working across the country to do this really important work of bridging faith and science uh, for communities and helping them to uh, negotiate for themselves. Um, what does it mean to take an HIV vaccine and to be a person of faith? Um, what does it mean to participate in the trial as an example? And we saw so many instances of people 
changing their mind about you know getting the COVID-19 vaccine or deciding to now participate in the trial because they heard from some of these amazing uh, advocates and faith leaders that they consider trusted voices. Some of the other amazing partnerships that we uh, had existing and that we uh, built new partnerships, relationships with during this process are listed here. Um, again, I can't put them all on slides, but um, quite a few different organizations. Again, um, many of them within the HIV arena, so many of them outside of the HIV uh, sort of space, um, but all of them committed, all of them wanting the information, all of them wanting to hear from, from us to have information to share with their communities and to, to do so regularly. <laughs> um, so many sessions we held. We also organized, in addition to partnering with community groups to assist with them organizing uh, sessions, education sessions, webinars, we also organized one of our own called COVID in Black, uh, which was really successful. It completed six or seven episodes, uh, one of them focusing specifically on uh, Black women um, and COVID, <clears throat> talking about science, health literacy, and clinical trials. Um, and really the folks who are uh, panelists in these uh, sessions represent geographic diversity as well as diversity in age and, and occupation, et cetera. Um, for many of these episodes, we saw attendance in upwards of 100 to 200,000. For one of them in particular, we saw uh, 480,000 people attend. So these were uh, very engaging, um, definitely uh, lots of folks tuning into them. We did them in partnership with uh, blackdoctor.org and, and sometimes for some of the episodes, uh, partnership with other groups as well. In addition to COVID and Black, uh, we organized COVID and people of color uh, to talk more about sort of uh, the intersectionality across uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, there was a webinar series we supported from one of our faith ambassadors called Iman and COVID, uh, providing education and information to the, the Muslim community. Um, other activities, Pandemia, uh, which is a series now that is on episode 14 or 15, I think, and it is focused on um, health information, COVID, in uh, Latin and Hispanic communities. And of course, we had a premiere session with Dr. Fauci and several of our partners, including uh, the historically uh, Black medical colleges and, uh, and other groups. And I just want to wrap up with a few pieces. Uh, saw quite a bit of diversity in uh, the COVID-19 vaccine trials that we worked on with our pharmaceutical partners. Um, for the uh, Moderna trial, we saw about 47.3% of the trial participants were women. Uh, for the AstraZeneca trial, about 44.4%. For the J&J &J trial, about 45.1%. For the Novavax trial, about 48.4%. Um, so just under half of the study participants in each of these trials uh, identified as women. And I think that that's a pretty uh, important statistic to share for this audience. We also saw significant reach. Um, I think one of the important things that I want to draw attention to here is just uh, sort of the total reach. Um, and what we're talking about here are uh, between August and December of 2020 only, so less than six months, covering these sorts of events that I described, those virtual events, you know, being able to reach um, more than two and a half million people. Uh, during that time frame, uh, shows that people were really interested in information. They were really interested in um, in understanding what was happening uh, with the pandemic, and we were able to provide and respond to that. Um, in addition to that, we've worked on a couple of publications that um, have focused on efforts to increase diversity in clinical trials. Uh, so those are reflected here, and again, I can share. Uh, I'm happy to share or the organizers can share the slides afterwards. And the Stakeholder Engagement Strategic Plan, uh, again, the link is here. It's also on the preventcovid.org website. Uh, so thanks again to the organizers of this session. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here to talk to you all.
Dr. Wallace, uh, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. I'm wondering if we could get to them. Um, I'm going to just pose them to you if that's okay. Um, the first question I see here is, can you share details about the diversity of attendees for COVID in the Black Series? You may have addressed this, but just wondered if you could touch upon that briefly. I can. Those sessions um, weren't organized in a way that allowed us to collect demographics. They were streamed on our virtual platforms. So people could just tune in from, uh, you know, Facebook or YouTube or, or however else they were engaging. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and also, do the, do the reasons why people do or do not get vaccinated differ depending on gender and race? I think they depend. Yeah, yeah, I think, and, and um, my colleague, Dr. Shattuck, might have some perspective about this as well. I think that the, the, the reasons are varied, and I think some of them may be able to be sort of compartmentalized, like you may be able to look at um, similarities, right, across gender and race, but they're really nuanced. Um, I talked to some people in upstate New York, for example, who said that they weren't interested in being vaccinated or participating in a trial because they didn't want to be injected with COVID and syphilis. You know, I've heard uh, misinformation about uh, a microchip being implanted in people. Um, and, and so there's lots of reasons. Um, and I think a lot of these things have to do with culture. They have to do with um, the politics and, and, and the various, well, perception is, is part of it, sure. But I think it's also how people are navigating this sort of racist and uh, oppressive society that we're all navigating. So Sure. and how that impacts them. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions. Um, and I know I think we may have to wrap up soon, but how do you disseminate your information to smaller local groups so that lay people are aware of your efforts? Um, we've done this through multiple strategies. We've done this online. We've done this by working with um, grassroots groups who have uh, deep reach within local communities. We've done this with local physicians. We've done this with um, uh, local boys and girls clubs, with uh, local chapters of the AARP. <laughs> so lots of different groups, in addition to the national groups, working with lots of, la lots of local groups as well to get information out. And, uh, and the materials that we put out, the, specifically the print materials, I will say that um, our standard is to make sure that we can get the materials down to at least an eighth grade level. We try to get it down to a sixth grade um, literacy level, um, but that's you know to assure accessibility to the materials as well. Great. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, there was a question for Dr. Shattuck Heidorn. I don't know if it was uh, posed earlier, but uh, I, I can pose that now if you'd like. Um, do you have an, I don't know if she's still on, or if Dr. Shada Kydorn is still on the line, but. Um, I am, I'm here. Okay. Wonderful, sorry, I came in kind of no late. Worries. Do you have any suggestions for more gender inclusive scientific research and when looking at sex and gender differences, how can we classify participants' gender? Yeah, um, so I think I would, if people are interested in that for their own projects, um, I would probably point you to the NIH uh, Sex and Gender Minority Research uh, division, and they just published a report um, sponsored by the National Academy um, that dives into this. This is a this is a complex question that really depends on the project. So, um, for large projects, like imagine you have a million people answering something, the amount of people that won't understand um, a gender question that's like too complex for them and will answer it inaccurately, um, if the prevalence of a um, of a gender, uh, particular gender identity is very, very low, like 1% or less of the population, then the noise introduced by asking questions that um, people might not expect uh, will actually could overwhelm uh, that. So in, in smaller studies, um, there's some wonderful ways that people do uh, really complex ways of understanding gender identity. Um, and then in bigger studies, there's some, there's starting to be like best practice recommendations. Okay, thank you very much for that response. Um, I do have a question I do see here for Dr. Wallace. If uh, you can come back on the line, that would be helpful. Um, 
what methods do you use to ensure readability at an eighth grade or sixth grade level? Our, um, our staff here in the operations center have experience doing this. And uh, to sort of measure that, we use the flish Kincaid scale, um, as well as the stats that we, that we do from the accessibility features within Microsoft Word. Great, thank you. And I think that uh, both of you have been kind enough to put your emails or provided that information in case folks would like to follow up with any additional questions. Um, uh, thank you both for your presentations. Are there any other questions? I'm just I'm gonna make sure that I've covered anything that's in the chat. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amin and Dr. Wallace and, and Shadok Hydorn. Um, now we'll turn the virtual mic over to Dr. Clay Clayton to close us out for today. And thank you all, to all of our attendees. We so appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Uh, along with my ORWH colleagues, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank our amazing presenters, Drs. Heather Shadok Hydorn and Dr. Stefan Wallace, the CIT support team for helping us make sure we're on board, ORWH Communications and Operations, and all the attendees of today's Diverse Voices session. We appreciate your interest in and commitment to turning scientific advances into positive health impacts for all women. And I'd like to share information about two upcoming events with you. Next slide. First, ORWH invites you to save the date for a scientific workshop on gender and health on Wednesday, October 26th. This is a virtual workshop and it's entitled Gender and Health, Impacts of Structural Sexism, Gender Norms, Relational Power Dynamics, and Gender Inequities. And it's being convened in partnership with multiple institutes and centers listed on the slide here. In line with the ORWH mission of putting science to work for the health of women, this workshop will convene members of the scientific community to discuss methods and best practices in biomedical and socio-behavioral research on gender roles, gender norms, gender inequity, and structural sexism, and their consequences for health and disease. We are accepting abstracts until August 31st, and you can visit the abstract portal for more details and to submit. Second, we want to invite you to save the date for the September 29th, 2022, our next session of Diverse Voices that's going to focus on the impacts of trauma and addiction on pregnant and postpartum people, featuring presentations from Natasha DeJena of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and Sana Lim of the New York University Grossman School of Medicine. For any additional information on ORWH efforts to promote equity-oriented research and advance science for the health of all women, please check our website, www.nh.gov slash women. Thank you to our speakers, to our attendees, to our team over WH members and everyone supporting us behind the scenes. This concludes today's session.